Hello, I'm Alan Hefner, an adult critical care and emergency medicine specialist at Carolinas Medical Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. In this video, we will review the topic of circulatory shock. We will review the progression of shock, including a review of typical physiologic compensatory mechanisms that precede decompensated shock. We will also cover how compensatory mechanisms might make traditional assessments less reliable and how advanced hemodynamic monitoring can be used to help clinicians identify and manage at-risk patients earlier in the progression. Shock is best described by the inability of the circulation to meet cellular metabolic demands to sustain normal function. Viewed from this perspective, it is important to recognize that no single easy clinical marker allows us to define shock at the bedside. In the absence of such a marker, nonspecific parameters, such as heart rate and blood pressure, are commonly used as indicators of shock. Acute hypovolemia is a common cause of shock in clinical practice. As a pure form of acute shock, it also provides an instructive model to demonstrate the physiologic mechanisms of compensation and associated clinical markers. Many of the concepts we will cover in this video can also be applied to the other forms of shock. Reviewing the hemodynamic trend of an acutely bleeding patient allows us to highlight the late nature of hypotension that occurs after the onset of bleeding. From the onset of hypovolemia, serial physiologic countermeasures are activated to maintain cardiac output and defend blood pressure. Let's review them from the onset of bleeding. An initial response to acute hypovolemia is catecholamine-mediated venoconstriction. This contracts venous capacitance to maintain the pressure gradient for right heart venous return with the goal of sustaining stroke volume despite early hypovolemia. Catecholamine release also increases heart rate, which maintains cardiac output in the setting of decreasing stroke volume. However, a number of factors influence this anticipated heart rate response. Up to one-third of patients demonstrate relative or absolute bradycardia during severe hypovolemia. The implications are that limited heart rate response also limits hemodynamic compensation and the use of tachycardia as a sign of hypovolemia or shock. Age-limited heart rate response, drugs that attenuate heart rate, and enhanced vagal tone, including that related to pain or anxiety, are some mechanisms that limit the classic described tachycardic response in hypovolemia. As hypovolemia progresses, endogenous catecholamine surge continues, inducing peripheral tissue precapillary vasoconstriction to redistribute cardiac output within the systemic circulation. Redistribution of limited cardiac output from non-essential organ beds comes at the expense of reduced perfusion to these tissues. Even when the source of the acute hypovolemia is repaired, circulating volume must be adequately restored to prevent persistent organ malperfusion and associated complications. The splanchnic circulation and gastrointestinal tract are especially affected by this catechol-mediated blood flow diversion. This intestinal microscopy example demonstrates marked reduction in mucosal microcirculation in response to acute 10% blood loss. Due to limitations in real-time gut perfusion monitoring, it is commonly undiagnosed until gut ischemia has occurred long enough to cause patient symptoms. Clinical markers of this gut malperfusion may include nausea, vomiting, anorexia, abdominal bloating, adenamic ileus, and even remote complications stemming from compromised gut barrier function. Now let's look at the progression of hypovolemia through the lens of advanced hemodynamic parameters. Our bodies are designed to defend blood pressure rather than blood flow as hypovolemia severity worsens. Systemic pressure is maintained in the context of declining stroke volume and cardiac output by peripheral vasoconstriction, represented here by elevated systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. Recognizing this pattern of deteriorating stroke volume is made more complicated by the infrequency of real-time stroke volume measurements at the bedside. Left unchecked, vasoconstriction to support blood pressure approaches a physiologic limit, after which the patient develops systemic hypotension. This is traditionally defined by the thresholds of systolic blood pressure 90 or 100 or mean arterial pressure of 65 in adult patients. As such, hypotension is a late sign of shock that occurs after the body's compensatory mechanisms are overwhelmed or exhausted. And remember, by the time we recognize a struggling macrocirculation manifested as hypotension, the microcirculation has likely been compromised for a much longer period of time. Self-limited episodes of hypotension are a noteworthy signal 
heralding exhaustion of cardiovascular reserve. Unless this typical physiologic response is appreciated as a first sign of exhausted vasoconstriction, transient hypotension may be falsely ascribed to an erroneous or insignificant blood pressure measurement. Our current practice of intermittent blood pressure monitoring, even with higher frequency in acute care medicine, also limits the ability to detect episodic hypotension. Sustained hypotension is an ominous sign, representing deterioration to decompensated shock. It often heralds more rapid clinical deterioration, including sudden cardiac arrest, unless corrected. Now let's review how modern advanced hemodynamic monitoring can help clinicians identify and manage at-risk patients earlier in their clinical course. Mary P. is a 67-year-old female on aspirin therapy presenting to the emergency department with acute rectal bleeding. Admission vital signs show a blood pressure of 126 over 72 and heart rate of 92. Mary is evaluated and is appropriately recognized as suffering acute GI hemorrhage with a plan for admission and evaluation for intervention. Initial labs demonstrated hemoglobin of 11 and lactate of 2.2. Two hours later, Mary is alert but fatigued and has not experienced recurrent rectal bleeding since arrival. However, repeat vital signs are blood pressure 87 over 52 with a heart rate of 101. A rapid response is called, and IV fluid and blood resuscitation are initiated for acute hemorrhagic shock. Now let's relive the scenario with the addition of continuous advanced hemodynamic monitoring via application of an Acumen IQ sensor. Mary's initial data and monitoring did not provide insight into her degree of acute blood loss and clinical trajectory. Additional hemodynamic information provided a different insight into Mary's condition. Despite normal tension, severe hypovolemia, and reduced cardiac performance with blood pressure sustained by intense vasoconstriction was readily identified. HPI, or hypotension prediction index parameter, was also elevated, indicating increased hemodynamic instability and probability of systemic hypotension. You can learn more about the HPI parameter and algorithm in previous episodes, which are linked in the description below. Resuscitation was proactively initiated by the care team. In response, Mary's hemodynamic measures normalized and HPI parameter decreased, confirming improved hemodynamic stability. Most importantly, Mary's acute hypotension, an event associated with adverse outcome, was prevented. When caring for patients with signs of cardiovascular insufficiency or at high risk of shock, I leaned on advanced monitoring to assist in the early recognition differentiation, and management of hemodynamic instability. Tune in to the next Critical Insights episode, where we'll continue our conversation on advanced monitoring. Like this video and subscribe to stay up to date on clinical educational videos, symposium recordings, and more. For more clinical education resources offered by Edwards Life Sciences, check out the links in the description below.